Our lecture this morning will be on what was spoken on Pentecost Day. What was said on Pentecost Day? We are told, and many say unknown tongues, no, 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 quite the contrary. They spoke with tongues of fire. They were understood. That is to say, as far as the linguist would be concerned, they were heard. It was very clear. It needed no interpreter. And people talk about the tongues and write things into it, but they never ask what was said. What upset these people? So we come to the time that we must take a look. We must learn more about what was said on that day, and then perhaps we're getting close to the truth of Almighty God that that he would reveal to us that was spoken by Joel the prophet, and that is the trumpet cry of the end time. It began a long time ago, and I want to tell you a little story, if I may. Aaron, Moses was, well, I'll tell you, if we may, let's just turn to Exodus chapter 4. Won't you do that with me? Exodus chapter 4. Let's take this gently here. Let's lay a little groundwork and let's see if the Father would not let those that have ears to hear understand concerning this. Exodus chapter 4. Let's drop down to verse 10 if we may. Let's understand a little bit about the speaking of Almighty God. How does he arrange it? And I'm speaking only of those tongues that were spoken of on Pentecost Day that needed no interpreter. Verse 10, chapter 4, Exodus, And Moses said unto the Lord, O Lord, oh my Lord, I am I'm not eloquent, to, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue, Moses speaking. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Now think about that a moment. Who formed that vessel that has the capability of making and forming the sound? Or who maketh the dumb or deaf or the seeing or the blind? Hath not I the Lord? Is it not I that have done this? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. Who is supposed to teach us? Almighty God. We only have the mouth, the vessel. And he said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. You send a messenger. Send somebody. Don't use me in a way referred. Anybody. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? Levite, um, and Aaron, rather, meaning teacher. Is not the teacher your brother? I know that he can speak well, and also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. Uh, and thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth. Who's going to put words in the Levite's mouth? Moses. Uh, and I will be with thy mouth, the Father speaking from uh, Moses' mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you what ye shall do. And he shall be thy spokesman. I want you to know, this is your interpreter. Aaron, the teacher, shall be your interpreter. That is to say, the things that God gives unto man, he shall interpret it unto the people, and he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. Interesting statement. Now, turn with me, if you will, to Numbers chapter 10. I want you to bear in mind, if you will, that day of Pentecost, Pentecost being 50, the 50th day, when these tongues were spoken. And it is said, do we or do we not speak in tongues, but it is rarely ever asked what was said. 
That's where the importance is. What was said? It needed no interpreter, yet it's not written to most ears. And they continue on the debate of tongues. But what did God say? That is the message. That 50 itself being the base root number used in the tabernacle of God should mean more than just 50 to you. The number in a sense that the tabernacle is constructed by. The tabernacle of who? The tabernacle of Almighty God. Numbers 10, verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver, for a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camp. This is a special trumpet. It is not a ram's horn. It is a very special trumpet, a trumpet that is used only for a call of warning or happiness being one and the same, for the call of warning is happiness to the heart of those that have ears to hear that understand the warning. you understand what I mean? And when they shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And if they blow by, but with one trumpet, then the princes, which are heads of the thousand of Israel, shall gather themselves unto thee. In other words, Moses was probably one of, he knew more military strategy in as much as he was raised by Pharaoh. He was a military man as well. I want you to see the organization, the obedience to God's horn. For, why did he say two horns here? Let's, let's get this out of the way first. Why did he say two trumpets? It's very simple. Aaron only had two sons at this time. Well, he had had four sons, but two were struck dead. Nadab, which in the Hebrew tongue means liberal, and Abihu, which means he is my father, were struck dead for a very special reason. They were outside that tabernacle, which is made up of the base root of 50, 50 being Pentecost, the day when the true word came. They were just outside that tabernacle, and they were told to kindle the fire in their lamps. Uh, but what did they do? This one called liberal, and this one called he is my father, you have to supply Yah leaving a question as to who he considers his father, kindled uh, their censers with strange fire. Not the fire that is perpetual from the altar of God, but something man-made, man-instigated, man-instituted into and supposedly to come out as the incense of God. So be careful, friend. They were both struck dead like that. Is it real or is it of God? Do we have knowledge and wisdom concerning the Holy Spirit in the end times or do we play guessing games? What was said on Pentecost Day? Mature people do not ask what tongue. It didn't matter. All understood. But who asked what was conveyed? What message? What communication? That's what's important. The reason only two horns were used is because there were only two sons left to blow the horns, and only the priest uh, could sound that warning. Only the priest of the end times, the ministers of fire, can sound that trumpet. Uh, that is to say, those that God would choose to utilize, to control their lives, to bring them into that point in time whereby that warning could be sound, not to be interpreted by man but by those priests to sound the warning. What were the two sons that sounded the warning? Eleazar, one, and it has a, very, a much more in-depth meaning in the New Testament where he comes to light again. It means help of God, our Father. And Ithamar, the land of the palms. Oh, how the palms even entered into the path that Jesus rode into Jerusalem preparing the way for the true Messiah. It was these two 
Later, in Solomon's temple, there would be 120 of these trumpets, uh, these special trumpets. Oh, dear one, do you see the hand of God to answer me one question? How many people were present? How many converted to the priesthood, into the congregation that day of Pentecost, when those, again, those cloven tongues, that fire from the altar of God came forth? How many were there? I said the horns increased to 120. There were exactly 120 souls up joined to the church that day. But again, the question is the same. What was said? We, all we talk about is tongues. To a linguist, this means absolutely nothing. It conveys no message other than it is the muscle which forms and shapes the mouth that causes the word. God said, I will. Use your mouth, Moses. But it is the priest uh, that will bring forth uh, the word, that will sound uh, the alarm. What alarm? What message? What was said? More later. So we see then, and here I've lost my place in numbers. I got so wrapped up there with, with where we're going. We'll let the Father take back over here. Or was he? Is he now? Yes, he is, of course. One blast calls in the leaders of the various tribes, okay? And verse 5, When you blow an alarm, then the camps that lie on the east part shall go forward. 6, And when you blow an alarm the second time, then the camps that lie on the south side shall take their journey. They shall blow an alarm for their journey. I want you to see the organization, the discipline, but when the congregation is to be gathered together, ye shall blow, but ye shall not sound an alarm. An alarm was sharp. Maybe that's a poor imitation of a trumpet, but be that as it may, it sounded alarm. Dear one, for the deeper scholar, I want to add the Septuagint, which was taken for, from far older Hebrew manuscripts than this King James I'm reading from, has another edition here. It covers the rest of the camp, and I would recommend that you double-check. I just want to show you nothing was left out in the original order. We didn't just take part of the tribe in the warning. It goes on to the fourth sound of warning in the Septuagint. You gather the congregation when it sounds. That means into one what? One unit, meaning one what? One body. What body? The many-membered body of Jesus Christ. That's what it's ultimately building to. What was said, though? What upset those people? They're drunk. The whole bunch is drunk. They could hear what they were saying, but why would they still make a remark like that as to what these men were saying that day on Pentecost, that 50th day, that number that is the base root of the building of the tabernacle? And the sons of Aaron, the priest, shall blow with the trumpets, and they shall be to you for an ordinance forever throughout your generations. How long? Throughout all your generations uh, in this earth age. But first, you must, and does that mean we're supposed to go out here and take one piece of metal and beat out a bunch of trumpets? Of course not. This is only symbolic. What did the horn, what was it used for? Communication. Contact. That's why one of the main reasons Israel won its battles because it was organized. It was disciplined. They all fought as one mind, the mind of God, for it was God that gave instructions when, where, and how by the trumpet to move as one body. That's why the words that were spoken by those tongues is so important for those that are mature in Christ's word on Pentecost Day, 50, the base root of the building of the tabernacle in which the altar of fire rested, from which the incense, uh, the real truth that you speak with tongues, else God strike you dead on the day that Satan comes, for those that do not speak with the correct tongue and say, God told me to do this, will be a very serious offense uh, when that day comes. And if you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresses thee, oppresses you, then ye shall blow an alarm with the trumpet, and ye shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and ye shall be saved from your enemies. 
What does that mean? God says, if you do it my way and you discipline yourself, I'll give you the victory. Do you know what that translates to you today? You do it God's way. You stay out of his way. Don't you get in his way. You do it God's way as it was written, as Christ said ever so many times, haven't you heard it's written? As long as you do it God's way, by sounding the alarm, he says, I'm going to give you the victory. It's that simple. No big deal to it. I'm able, he says. I will give you the victory over your enemies. Uh, we have nothing to fear nor to worry about, dear one. Also, in the day of your gladness, you know what this is? This is important. In the day of your gladness and in your solemn days and in the beginnings of your months, this means your celebrations, you shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings. We don't have burnt offerings anymore. They're done away with. They were replaced by the body of Jesus Christ. And over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, that they may be to you for a memorial before your God. I am the Lord your God. That is a memorial to sound that warning over the sacrifice. Then to sound the warning, if Christ is now that sacrifice, de facto, then what is the warning over? The warning is concerning the word of Yeshua Messiah, Jesus Christ, uh, his teachings, which are simply a fulfillment or a bringing to pass these old laws that are written and examples set forth to simplify what they said on Pentecost Day. What is this term they spoke in? It needs no interpreter. And yet, what was said? Turn with me to the 89th Psalm. I'm going to begin reading, if I may, at verse 1, and I'm, I want it to explain itself. You've heard it many times, but I hope it takes on a different meaning in a way. God, through this one, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. Do you understand? With my mouth, uh, God being the controller thereof. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shall thou establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant. That means a contract with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. The, thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Shelah. Remember, this is a song, and Shelah means you stop, you think, you meditate a moment. And what he's going to do He's going to, through, from the recital he just gave, he wants you to pause for a moment in that song. And he's going to connect the praise with it. For this is a time of praise. And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. Wherever the saints are, whether they be in heaven or on earth, but they will have ears to hear and understand. For who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? Even the angels themselves cannot be likened unto God, is what is said here. He's in control. He's our everything. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. Anywhere he is, he gets number one attention. His very presence uh, demands it to and receives it, given freely and with love. Else there's something wrong. O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong God like unto thee? Or to thy faithfulness round about thee? Thou rulest the raging of the sea. When the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. He controls, yes, even the very elements uh, when you are with him. Thou hast broken Rehab. This is a... a, uh, a uh, political name for Egypt, in pieces as one that is slain, thou hast scattered thine enemies with thy strong arm. In other words, you delivered us from the captivity of Pharaoh. The heavens are thine, the earth also is thine. Never forget that. God is as concerned, if you would, especially with his children here, every created being, 
with earth as he is with heaven. It's that proving, testing ground as for the world and the fullness thereof thou hast founded them. He created it. Should he not receive reverence? The north and the south, thou hast created them. Tabor, this would be south, and Hermon, this would be north, shall rejoice in thy name. That means from in a complete circle. Thou hast a mighty arm, strong is thy hand, uh, and high is thy right hand. Who sits at his right hand, beloved? Justice and judgment, or righteousness, if you would, are the habitation, or the foundation, better translated, of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before it. Now listen closely. This is why we came here. Blessed, underline that. You can believe it. Blessed is the people that mow the joyful sound. Do you know what this is in Hebrew? We just read of it in Numbers. It's the sound of that specific trumpet. Blessed are people that have ears to hear and understand the sound of that trumpet. Even they would know and understand what was spoken on Pentecost Day rather than talking about it being a mystery. They would know and be enlightened by Almighty God. Naturally, they're blessed because they are the ones God uh, made a covenant with to fulfill and bring to pass uh, the prophecies therein. Just write in your margin, the joyful sound is the sound of the trumpets. Remember the last verse, they shall be your joyful sound on your assemblies, all right, forever. The priest doing what? Speaking. God's word. It just stated how that he had created all these things. Who would not be delighted and pleased if they understood and heard God's word? His truth, huh? not confusion. That comes from Satan. They shall walk. They will do what? They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. Oh, why wouldn't they be blessed? No confusion, but understanding and maturity and truth from God's word. In thy name shall they rejoice all, thy, all the day, and in the righteousness shall they be, in thy righteousness shall they be exalted. You know what? You don't have to worry about falling, beloved, when you're in that covenant, in that contract. Oh, you're going to have some bad times because sometimes we get off the path a little bit and God has to gee haul us a little bit. And like uh, these folks across the line in Missouri, I'm sorry, those animals across the line in Missouri, you have to get their attention. Um, I, I, you know, I, I'm going to offend someone. You have all heard the story of the Missouri mule and how you get his attention with the two before. All right? Okay? I'm not. That's not a pun at anyone or anything. I just mean God has to correct us sometimes. Yeah, that's righteousness. Do you understand that? When God punishes you, hey, praise him. He loves you. He's, he's reaching down and saying, I love you, and I want you to come around because I have this obligation that you must perform. I'm going to move you. Just say, thank you, Lord. Which way? <laughs> when? I'm ready. Because you know, that means he loves you. He will not interfere in the lives of those he does not love. So just thank him for it. For thou art the glory of their strength, and in thy favor our horn shall be exalted. Our horn, let's look at that spiritual, it means our power shall be exalted, for he is our power, but let's let that horn also be the trumpet. For as long as it is his word, our trumpet shall be exalted. Even as this trumpet that is built at the back church, which points to the heavens, which carries the word to the world. His word, the ministries that have truth of God in them, that are a blessing to those people that are so, so deceived in today's world and times, that need to be fed the truth of his word, whereby they also may enjoy that righteousness. For the Lord is our defense, and the Holy One of Israel is our King. We have none other. He is our King. Then thou spakest in vision to the Holy One, and saidest, I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. That one, of course, is our Messiah, Jesus Christ. 
I want you to complete that at home, that chapter. It is very important for it. It brings forth those words that are so joyful to our ear as we study Almighty God's Word. Now, back to the question. What was said on Pentecost Day? What was said on Pentecost Day? Let's go back to Pentecost and let's bring this in and let it not be a mystery as to what speaking in this tongue is to you from this day forward. Acts chapter 2. Number one, bear in mind, who is it that would blow the horn? Those two sons of Aaron, Aaron meaning the teacher or the interpreter, who were priests given of God's help, uh, that did not take strange fire and kindle the incense, that is to say, that odor of God. It must come from God. There are no shortcuts. There are no 90-day wonders uh, made by man. They can be instantly made by God, however. As you all know this story, and I just want to anchor this right real good to the foundation. Jesus appeared on the 40th day. 40 means probation. There were 120 people that were joined on that 50th day, 50 being the base root, or not the base root. Let me correct myself. More or less the basic number on which the tabernacle was designed. There came forth then 120 trumpets in Solomon's time. These numbers should mean something to you. 120 members, yet with many more thousands. But it was important on this day because I want to tell you something. The fact that it began with two, so shall it end with two, and those two are the two witnesses. But 120 is three times 40. In God's eyes, there are three times of probation. There are three testings and probations his people would be put through, to, uh, and that is to say, to the babahu in the Hebrew tongue, which is, that is to say, the probation that was in the world that, that was, and Satan fell along with one-third of God's children. The first forty. Not many eyes are able to remove the blinders of this mere flesh age to know, but God's word tells it all. Then came the very earth age we are in now, which is another 40, a time of probation. And then comes the millennium, which is the final 40. Do not think I'm saying 40 years or anything else. I'm saying probation, a time of probation. Then, beloved, peace, real peace, true peace. But 10 days later, they having that 10 days tribulation that those that sound that trumpet shall have on the appearance of Antichrist. Uh, then on the 50th day he appeared, Pentecost. Again, I'm repeating myself, but I don't want you to forget it. The base number used in the tabernacle, the tabernacle outside the, which those two fakes were killed instantly for partaking of strange fire. You see, there's a strange fire coming, and my warning is stay away from it if you enjoy life, eternal life, that is. Uh, verse 2. Now, chapter 2, verse 1, let's cover the, the thing. And when the day of Pentecost, that's that 50th, was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Unity, discipline, one body, one mind. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. This is Hurak, the spirit, uh, and it filled all the house uh, where they were sitting. Not even one little corner where one little member was sitting was left out. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues. This means, uh, if you would, they were the tongues like as a fire. They were distributed is what cloven means, all right? There was no, there were no prima donnas. It was distributed. Uh, and it set upon each of them. How many? They're one body anyway, you see, so you don't have to worry. One body means each of them meant all of them. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost. What is this Holy Ghost they were filled with? You know it was the Holy Spirit. But then what came out of their mouth? What did they say? And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Of. What other tongues? And they were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews. This means members of Judea. This has to do with citizenship, not race. Devout men out of every nation under heaven. In other words, it meant 
There was somebody there that spoke every language, every tongue that was spoke upon this earth, that they spake at that time. Now, when this was noised, when this voice came forth abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. They were stunned. Do you think they were stunned because they couldn't understand? Listen. They were confounded or stunned because that every man heard them speak in his own tongue. Now, how clear can God make it to one? They understood it. They each heard it in their own tongue. But what did they say? You see, it is better that you get to the base root of the truth of God rather than to design religions. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Aren't they supposed to be speaking in that dialect? I hear them speaking very clearly in my tongue. It needs no interpreter. And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? That was the miracle of God, beloved. He was giving those people a message, a message they didn't want to hear, a message they did not have ears to hear. It was the warning of the trumpet. It was very clear. It was precise. There's no great mystery about it. It's written throughout God's Word. Skip with me to verse... Uh, many of them mocked them. They said they were drunk. They're a bunch of idiots. If they understood why they were saying, why were they accusing them of being drunk? Think about it. Let it rest upon your soul and your mind. What were they saying that confused these people, that confounded them? Others, mocking, said, these men are full of new wine. Well, it's not yet even nine o'clock. In the, well, let's just read Peter's word. We've spent this much with it. Let's go on. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, and then the Judas is gone, lifted up his voice still and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. They were not his words, beloved. They were the words of God coming from this great fisherman. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. It's not even nine o'clock in the morning. You see, on, a, on this Pentecost day, a feast day, it was illegal and taboo to even sip wine before the noon hour, what we would call noon hour today. But this is that. Now listen, he's going to tell you something. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days. In other words, this is that. This is only a sample, but it's going to come to pass in the last days when those trumpets sound, when they speak clearly again that every ear hears understands uh, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons he didn't mean he was going to pour out that he didn't mean all flesh were going to speak this tongue he meant he was going to use his sons and his daughters uh, to pour the true word which is the Holy Spirit out upon all flesh they would all hear it for the gospel shall be preached to the entire earth when you are delivered up uh, before false messiah. You are not to premeditate what you'll say beforehand, but speak that, that the Holy Spirit gives you at that instant, that moment. But what was said here? It's quite obvious Peter was familiar with it. He identified it. He said all they're talking about is the book of Joel. Haven't you read it? They probably hadn't, though they were men of the cloth, many of them. As many men of the cloth today do not delve into the scriptures of Almighty God. You see, Jesus studied scriptures, but there was no New Testament at his time. When he said, it is written, he referred to Torah only, the Old Testament. Your sons and your daughters and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And, your, and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days. When is this going to come? When will this truth deliberately brought forth come in those days? of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. What days? Again, he made it very clear. Those days spoken of by Joel the prophet. Turn there real quickly with me in closing. In the Minor Prophets, we just completed it for the television audience. 
I have only one verse or two that I wish to take from it. And then we will understand what was said when they spoke in tongues on that day. What speaking in tongues, and I'm talking about that tongue, no other. The instruction after Joel was sh shown the locust army of the end times, Revelation chapter 9, that would come upon the entire world, uh, he was told what they should do that had the knowledge and the wisdom to understand those tongues that were spoken on Pentecost Day. Blow, chapter 2, verse 1, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm. What alarm? That alarm that was described to you in Numbers chapter 10 by the two. Two why? Two witnesses uh, of the end time. The end time message. That day when it would revert back to two again, utilized by all those that would hold them up. Uh, those two sin of God, not by man. Chosen by God, not by man. Not self-appointed but with God in control from the one body. And in my holy mountain let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Were you to sound the alarm on that day? No, before that day when it was nigh at hand. I'm going to tell you what those men said on Pentecost Day in closing. They told that group in Judea that day in Jerusalem they said, in the end times, there will be a false Christ, a false anointed one, will appear in Jerusalem. His children, his offspring, the Kenites, which are the locust army with their four hidden dynasties, that is to say, the four stages of the locust, to, as mentioned in this book of Joel, and they're going to devour the freedom of our people. You're going to lose. You're a bunch of losers. You're going to worship him. That locust army shall come down and certainly shall deceive and consume all except God's sons and daughters that shall stand against that army, that northern army, as it descends. They shall have the victory, but the rest of you are going to be judged because of your own self-determination and ways. You understand what I'm saying? I'm giving you a synopsis or a, a, a recap of the book of Joel. That's all they were saying. Can you imagine why they didn't want to hear it? They don't want to hear it any more today than they wanted to hear it then. When you say to those that are flying away, you're going to fly right into Antichrist's arms. I don't want to hear it. Are you drunk? Are you nuts? Are you insane? Coming around me with such talk as that, uh, don't you realize I'm a servant of God? I even speak in tongues. Now, I'm not mocking. I'm just saying the two that lit the lamp that is supposed to bring forth the tongues from the altar and cheated uh, were killed instantly. We're not playing church in these end times. We're playing with the fire of God. Do not make a mistake without repentance instantly when you're handling the fire of God which is to say, sounding the alarm in these end days. Are we all, is anyone among us perfect that we might not slip and be, as Moses, not eloquent in speech, and I'm not comparing us to Moses? Nope, there's not one of us that are qualified to speak for God. But all of you are qualified through faith to allow him to speak through you. Thus sounding the alarm. Is this something that you should puff yourself up about? We are a special people? Nope. Not at all. Because the very job that those that have ears to hear should have been accomplished long ago according to the gifts God gave our forefathers to bring it to pass from failure after failure after failure. So certainly our track record is not all that good, but his is. That's what's important. His is excellent for it's perfect. So let us not think ourselves to be perfect, but let us follow the perfect one. For he forgives our inadequacies. And when we have difficulty even in thinking, Father, what will we teach this day? He supplies uh, his truth uh, from his altar, not strange fire, beloved. 
Be careful of strange fire. So if someone tells you, were they speaking in tongues on Pentecost Day, you immediately reply, no, they were speaking, yes, they were speaking in tongues, many tongues. Do you know what they said? And watch their face, beloved. I'm not saying that to belittle anyone, but just simply ask them. It needed no interpreter. Do you know what they said? They received the Holy Spirit. What did they say? For it was not they that spoke, but the Holy Spirit. And again, do not, I clarify, I am talking only about those tongues that needed no interpreter. They're a class alone on Pentecost Day. And do you know something? Even the Gentiles later on could speak the same that the apostles did on that day, which means what? They were telling the same story. They understood what was going to happen in the last day, that even they could sound the alarm, could sound the trumpet. I hope that this has been a blessing to you. Oh, our Father's word, and his trumpet, his truth, must and will go forward in these end times, not in confusion, but in truth and clarity.